Okay. 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 So so let's see. Um, so so yesterday we turned our original question on its head, and we started to ask ourselves, well, if we state what labels are invariant, can we specify a group? And if you remember, yesterday we considered two types of um, invariants. So we said, well, maybe we would like this quantity to be invariant. And if we wanted that quantity to be invariant under our transformations, we found out the group that left this quantity invariant was OD. And then we said, so this is a D over here. Um, and then we said, well, let's supplement that by one extra condition. So if our invariants are the sum from i is equal to 1 to d of v i w i and this quantity. So, so I'm, I'm not writing down the sums, but of course, these repeated indices um, are to be summed. There are d of them. And now I contract this with any um, d vectors. So if I say I would like both of these to be invariant, the, the group that I've specified here is SOD. Okay? And it was this group that was related to what Jim was saying yesterday in his supersymmetry lectures. Okay, now what's the most natural thing we could do? So what we've considered there are real vectors. So we could decide now to start considering complex vectors. So we're going to change our invariants, and um, we're, we're now going to say that we would like the following quantity to be invariant. Um, so that was yesterday. What happens if we want the sum from i is equal to 1 to d of v i w i complex conjugate to be invariant. If we're taking the complex conjugate here, it means that we are now considering vectors whose components need not be real. They can be complex. So, so the transformation that I'm going to consider, I'm going to imagine that v i is allowed to go into u i j, v, j, and in fact, u need not be a real matrix now, okay? It is now allowed to have complex entries. So again, if I write this with, with bracket notation, this would be w, v, and my transformation law would be v goes into u times by v. In this case, to get the bra from the ket, I need to transpose and I need to complex conjugate. So I need to do the Hermitian conjugate. So if I want to figure out, this is the transformation rule for ket v. If I want the transformation rule for bra v, I need to complex conjugate and transpose this equation. So what it will become, I shouldn't write equals, I should say goes into. The transformation law for bra v would be that. Okay? Everybody happy with that? Now, what is then the condition that my invariant is invariant? Well, I need WV. This will go into W, U dagger. So there I've got the transformation rule for bra W. There's the transformation rule for ket v. And I want this to be invariant. So I would like this to stay w v. Once again, I'm going to write this as w the identity on v. Now I again say, well, I would like this relation to hold for any vector w and for any vector v. In particular, W and V can range over a complete basis. And that means that, in fact, I'm not looking at an equality between matrix elements. I'm looking at an equality between matrices. 
So I learn, in fact, that my condition is that u dagger u should be equal to 1. Okay? In exactly the same way that we saw requiring that matrices are orthogonal is consistent with closure, um, you can check that unitarity is consistent with closure. So let's imagine we have u1 dagger, u1 is equal to the identity, and u2 dagger, u2 is equal to the identity. So u1 is unitary, u2 is unitary. The question we ask ourselves if we want closure is, would u1, u2 be unitary? Well, let's check that. So we can calculate u1, u2 dagger times by u1, u2. What is this equal to? Well, when I want to take the Hermitian conjugate of a product like that, I swap the order of the factors and I dagger each factor. So I would get u2 dagger, u1 dagger, u1, u2. Well, those two collapse to give me the identity. So I've now just got u2 dagger, u2, and that collapses to give me the identity. So yes, this is consistent with closure. So um, I'm again going to get some sort of a matrix group here. The matrix group that I get, I call <coughs> UD. D tells me I'm dealing with D by D matrices. And uh, U tells me they are unitary. OK. So now what do we do? Well, when we've got a continuous group like this, we always try to check what do the generators look like. So let's see what the generators would, what properties would they have to have. Um, so we can set U equal to E to the I alpha times by the generator. Let's now calculate U dagger. So if we take the dagger of this, so U dagger would be equal to. So it's going to change the I into a minus I. So we'll get e to the minus i, we'll have an alpha, and we will have a t dagger. t gets daggered. And the unitarity condition, in fact, tells me that u dagger must be equal to the inverse of u. So I can put u to the minus 1 here, but u to the minus 1, I just change the sign in that exponent. So as a consequence, I learn that my generators are Hermitian. Okay, great. In fact, I told you that before. Remember, we put the I's in the right places because we said in quantum mechanics, unitary transformations are the ones that are relevant. And the reason why those are the ones that are relevant is that the magnitude of our wave vector tells us the probability um, that something will happen. So we normally normalize that to 1. And if we performed any transformation, we didn't want to mess around with that normalization. What is the, the, the transformation that will preserve that normalization? It's a unitary transformation. Um, and then we argued that, in fact, our generators would be Hermitian for the, for the choices of I's that we'd put in. So we've just recovered that again. So, so that's not a bad thing. Now let's try to figure out, well, how many of these um, generators are there? So if I want to build a Hermitian matrix, how can I do it? Well, one thing I could do, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down a bunch of matrices, and then you could add these with arbitrary real coefficients to get the most general Hermitian matrix you could think of. So at the moment, I'm trying to write down, if you like, a basis into which I could expand any Hermitian matrix. Well, what could I do? I could put noughts everywhere except at one point on the diagonal and, at, and, and noughts everywhere off the diagonal. And it's quite obvious that if I transpose complex conjugate that, I get that back again. How many of these are there? Well, there's D of them, right? Because I could put that 1 in any one of D diagonal positions. So there's D of those people. Then we've got something like this. Um, so let's call this column I and column J. So over here, we have row I and row j, I could decide to put a 1 over there and a 1 over there. 
If I take the complex conjugate transpose of that, I get that back again. How many of these are there? Well, we did this counting problem before. To choose where I'm going to put a 1, I can choose first my i index. If there's any one of d choices for the choice of i. When I choose j, I can choose anything except the value that I've got for i. So there's a total of d minus 1 choices for j. And then finally, if I, if I took this as my answer, I would be overcounting because I've counted that one and that one is independent. So I need to now divide by a factor of 2. So that's how many matrices there are of that form. And there's one more type of structure we could have, um, which looks like this. So there we've got the I, the J, the I, the J. And here we put an I, and sitting over here we put a minus I. You can see if I transpose complex conjugate that, once again, um, it comes back to its form, so it's Hermitian. How many of, of these are there? Well, this is exactly the same counting problem as for these. So over here, I will also get D times D minus 1 over 2. So let me add up what is the total number of generators. Well, it's D plus D times D minus 1 over 2 plus D times D minus 1 over 2. And that just gives me D squared. So I've got a total of D squared generators for U D. And that's also equal to the number of Hermitian matrices that there are. So what would I say? I would say to specify a unitary transformation, I need to give you D squared continuous labels. Um, another way of saying the same thing, I would say this is a Lie group of dimension D squared. <coughs> okay. Now, that's what we get when we allow the inner product to become complex. But when we were dealing with SOD, we also considered that epsilon. So let's generalize that too. Um, what would happen if we now require two invariants? So we're going to require that that inner product is invariant. And we are also going to require that that um, um, is invariant. Again, two invariants. And remember, the U, and V, and W, and so on appearing here are now complex vectors. So this is what distinguishes it from the case of the SOD. Now I'm going to run through exactly the same argument as I did in the SOD case. So I'm just going to be schematic and look back to what we did for SOD. So remember, how does our transformation work? Well, step number one, we transform UI1 goes into, let me choose another name for my vector so that it's no chance of mistaking notation. So WI1 would go into my unitary matrix, I1, J1, WJ1. The J1 index is repeated, so that's summed. So that's the transformation that I perform. What happens to my invariant? Well, that's the next thing we have to ask ourselves. Um, epsilon I1 up to ID. Um, WI1, YID would become, I need to transpose each of these, I need to transform each of these vectors. So it would become epsilon J1, J2, up to JD. Now for each of these vectors, I would get a factor of U. So I would have U, J1, I1, U, J2, I2, all the way up to U, J, D, I, D. And now I can track with my vectors again. So I would have my W, I, 1, my Y, I, D. Is everybody happy with that transformation law? Anybody want me to explain again how we got there? I will with pleasure. <coughs> 